I'm going to try this again. Uh, well, greetings, brothers and sisters in Messiah Yeshua. I'm um, going to give you a quick message about staying alert, especially in the days that we're in. Um, a lot of people are going to be led astray by things called strange teachings and, and by what, um, you know, many, many, many preachers in the Word are trying to, you know, discern in these days. And, you know, sadly, you know, many people are going to be led astray by unsound doctrine, you know, not the basics of what the, the Word shows us. So uh, I'm going to read some scripture and um, see where this goes. But what I'm hearing is stay alert and um, be wise. Okay, Hebrews 13, great chapter. You should read it. There's a couple of verses that stood out to me. One, one of them is that Yeshua the Messiah is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We know that um, we know that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever as well. I think it's Malachi three six. Um, no, not three. Is it three six? But um, we know He's the same. He doesn't change. Okay. Now, while God's judgment is assured, His mercies are everlasting. So we got to remember that our God is a, a loving God, a compassionate God. He desires His children to know Him and to be safe and secure. Um, yet we're by nature, very rebellious and non-submittal to him. So um, it's just a reminder. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, verse 9 of chapter 13 of Hebrews says, Do not be carried away by all kinds of strange teachings, for it is good for your heart to be strengthened by grace, not by foods that have no benefit to those occupied by them, that have not benefited those occupied by them. Okay, and then it goes on to talk about the altar, but this is a warning. Be aware that people are going to be carried away with all kinds of strange teachings, okay? There's thousands and thousands and thousands of different views on Scripture. I'm not saying I got it. In fact, I'm saying test what I'm saying because I could be misleading somebody and God forbid that that's the case. And the responsibility for teaching is, is very high, um, but also for you to discern what's good and evil, you're required to actually study to show yourself approved as a workmanship of Messiah. Um, so be, be strengthened by grace, okay? That's a big thing because a lot of churches today are going to be preaching about the grace of God. They talk about the grace of God, how awesome it is, and they are right. God's grace is awesome. But if you cheapen it into a license to sin, that's not the grace of God. That's a false light, and that's not what God commands us. So <clears throat> what is grace? Okay, grace is a number of things, but if you look up the word in Greek, charis, charis, it says it is the favor of God, which is amazing. You're saved by the favor of God, the blessing. Like he gives you grace that you don't deserve. So people think that once they're walking in the way, that somehow they're holy because they're you know, walking God's ways. No, it's, don't forget that God gave you grace to get you in, to graft you in through his son and his blood. So we don't cheapen that. We remember it. We remember that what Yeshua did always. He is the focal point. He is the foundation that was laid. Right, for our faith. And we build upon that foundation. You don't stay a little baby in a crib. You know, but today we see a lot of young people, 20, 30, even 40 year olds, they're still in the baby's crib. They won't get out. Well, I love Jesus and that's all I know. And they're still acting like a little child. So that might sound mean, but it's just true. You know, the warning of Revelation says, you're lukewarm. I'd rather you be hot or cold because then he could do something with you. But no, grace is not is not not just the favor of God. How do I know? Well, it says that it will be the conviction on your heart to obey the laws of God, the covenant of God. So um, let's go to Titus, okay? Because Titus says something about grace. It's beautiful. One of my favorite verses in the Bible, to be honest. Titus chapter 2, verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. And then it says this, training us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires to live a manner that is self-controlled, righteous, and godly when? In this present age. So the grace of God is defined in this section of scripture as a teacher. So of course, Paul's teaching about grace, right? And grace is the holy the conviction on your heart. So what is what else is the teacher? John chapter 14. John chapter 14. Okay, I'll read a couple verses. I want to show you where it says what grace is or what what else is um, the teacher. 
It says in John 14, 15, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Verse 16, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, so he may be with you forever, the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it does not know, behold him or know him. You know him because he abides with you and will be with you. Okay, and then he makes promises, not abandoning us as orphans, which is beautiful. He's with you. There's a helper like Messiah that is with us. It's the Spirit of truth. Okay, and it says don't grieve the Holy Spirit. So if we're grieving the Holy Spirit, you know, like that Spirit's not going to convict our heart. It's going to be our worldly ple pleasures and desires. That's why we're supposed to put away those things. Okay, verse 26. But the Helper, John 14, 26, the Holy Spirit, set apart Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name and teach you everything and remind you of everything that I've said to you. Okay, he's talking to the, the disciples at that time. Is he not talking to us right now? Didn't he say, if you love me, keep the commandments? And then, and also 1 John 5, 3 says, that's the love of God. It's not a burden. So people who are, who are telling you obedience to God's commandments is burdensome. They're fulfilling prophecy from Jeremiah and other scriptures. And also, you'll see that there's going to be people who are going to mislead people away from the true way. So people will accuse Paul of doing that. But Paul, if you read his letters, he's written them in such a way where he's trying to give people the straight way because people will go to the right, right? All truth all the time, right? Destruction, or they'll go to the left, all grace all the time, no truth. And we got to stay in the middle, grace and truth. Isn't that what Messiah came? John 1. It says John 1. And the word became flesh and tabernacled among us. He looked, we looked upon him, his glory, the glory of the one and only, from the Father, full of grace and truth. It's both. You got to have both. Okay, so we know that grace is more than just you know, God's given us his favor. It's also more than just the holy conviction on your heart to obey. So don't cheapen what it means by doing what the pastors are telling you to do or not do. Like, read the word for yourself and start studying the scriptures and see what these words mean. And then all of a sudden you're going to see, wow, like, God's teaching me. And it says you have no one, no need for anyone to teach you. Okay? Yeah, people can help exhort and, and instruct and give you sound teaching, but the Holy Spirit is the teacher. So the grace of God and the Holy Spirit, same thing. It's teaching your heart to do what's God, what God's will is, which is to obey his covenant. Okay, so there's a contrary to this as well, okay? There's a contrary to this as well. There's a bunch of places I could go, but where I feel led to take you now is in 2 Thessalonians chapter two. Now, this is twofold to show you that there's, there's the way, the truth, and the life, and then that there's an opposite of that or a, a forgery of that. But also with, with people right now, we're going to look for right now because the, they're in the media cycles, po politics, wars, earthquakes. Everyone's paying attention to all this stuff, right? The reason I know that there's bombs going off in Israel isn't because I have a, a social media app that tells me. It's because I know people there and I'm praying for them because they're under attack, right? So they know what they know there, right? But the media is gonna tell you how to think about it, what to post about it, and then people are, who are teachers of, of God's ways, right? Or Christian influencers, if you wanna call them that, they're gonna to try to make you believe something that, that they're gonna show you that, that is prophecy, right? And they're gonna go, look, this is what's happening in prophecy, the Gog and Magog war. And you're like, I'm like, I'm like, are you kidding me? People are going to fall for that. Why? Because they like their page and they think that they're going to tell them the truth. And it's like, they're not going to tell them the truth. They're going to tell them what they've been programmed to tell them. So, my cat's trying to get me. Okay, so go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. It says, now we ask you, brothers and sisters, concerning the coming of our Lord Yeshua. Why, why is that a big deal? Because people are waiting for him to come. A sincere believer, whose set, his life is set apart, not perfect, but you know, being sanctified by the truth. We're looking, we're waiting. We're like, wow, the signs are here. Israel springing up all over, right? So we know that the near, the, the, the fig tree is blooming. We know that there's wars and rumors of war. We know there's earthquakes in diverse places. You know, we know all these things. The, the sun is gonna turn dark and the moon to blood, right? All these signs that, uh, that, that are gonna happen after the great tribulation. And he's saying, 
I want you to know these things. Paul the Apostle is saying these things concerning our Lord Yeshua and his coming and our gathering together to him, not to get shaken out of your mind or disturbed, either by a spirit or a word or letter as if through us, as the day of the Lord has come. So don't be disturbed or shaken because the day of the Lord has, hasn't come. Okay, That's the day of judgment. Let no one deceive you in any way, for the day will not come until the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed. The man of lawlessness might be already in people's hearts. I don't know, right? You know, we're the temple. Who sits on the throne of your heart? Is it Yeshua, the Messiah, the King of Israel, the King of the world? Or is it the Antichrist because we haven't tested or discerned the spirits to know if it's true or false? This is a big deal. But, but, um... The Antichrist, the, the one, the lawless one he's called, it says the day will not come until the man of lawlessness is revealed. So think about it. He's warning us, the Apostle Paul, inspired words, that don't be shaken or disturbed because there's going to be one that rises up who's a lawless one. So what are the people of the world doing today? They're moving things around, right? They're aligning their forces. The kingdoms are aligning, right? And they're going to create a, a an environment where people are thinking about the things of the world, all the worldly things that are happening that they can't control, and they're missing that they could be deceived and follow a lawless Christ. So when this lawless Christ was revealed, Jesus, right? Could be his name. I don't know. Seems logical because they're promoting Jesus now in the mainstream media, you know? So that's why I don't call him, you know, Jesus. I call him Yeshua or Yehusha, you know, but I will refer to him as Jesus because I think Christian people need to know which Jesus or Christ they're talking about, which Messiah, because it's important. He said, I come in my Father's name, John 5, 43. He says, and you, you won't receive me, but another will come in his own name and you will receive him. That's a warning. He says, the one destined to be destroyed, the lawless one is destined to be destroyed. He opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he sits in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Everyone's like, oh, the third temple is coming. We need, uh, the red heifers are gonna be sacrificed, right? I'm not worried about that. You know, the sacrificial temples they build are not going to be of Yah. They're not. You don't think the devil knows like, like how to twist scripture? I mean, Peter Peter warned that they're going to twist Paul's letters into licentiousness. 2 Peter 3, 14 through 17. And that's the last day's um, warning too that, that Peter gives. So don't you remember that when I was still with you and I was telling you these things? And you know now, I'm sorry, and you know what now holds back from for him to be revealed at his own time. The mystery of lawlessness is already operating. So 2,000 years ago when this was written, the mystery of lawlessness was already operating. And he says, and uh, only there is one who holds back just now until he is taken out of the way. Then the lawless one will be revealed. Right now he's being restrained. He's being restrained because God's in control of everything. Yes, the prophecies that God put through the prophets, people are rejecting today. They don't read the Old Testament. They don't read the. They don't read it. Why don't people read the prophets? Because it's hard to read the prophets. The prophets are sort of mean. They're warning, right? But that the thing about the prophets is God always sent prophets to warn His people about the coming destruction, the day of judgment. And so, you know, Yeshua, Jesus said, "You people, you fools, are so you know about Him." He said, "You guys are fools about not learning what the prophets said." You know, and he started with Moses and the prophets when he was teaching the disciples or the, the, the men on the way to uh, Emmaus after his resurrection. So we need to know what the law and the prophets say. He even gave in, in Luke chapter 16, the rich man of Lazarus. Read the end of that. He said, if they do not believe the law and the prophets, Moses and the prophets, they will not believe if someone was raised from the dead. Because the rich man said, go back and warn my family because... They need to repent. I don't want them to come to this, this place of torment. So if people's family members are going to hell or, or died and didn't know Yeshua, they're probably crying out saying, please, I could go back and tell them. And, and the word of God says, if you don't believe Moses and the prophets, why would they believe that someone was resurrected from the dead? So verse eight of, of second Thessalonians two, the lawless one will be revealed. The Lord Yeshua will slay him with the breath of his mouth and wipe him out of the, with the appearance of his coming. So the false Messiah is going to rise up and a lot of people are going to follow him because he's going to probably make world peace and everyone's going to feel happy. 
But it says there's going to be peace and then sudden destruction. So the Messiah is going to come back and take out this lawless one. Okay, and it's going to be sneaky because there's a lot of people I, I know even on the, these, especially in the Messianic groups, they're like, they're cultish. They're talking about um, returning the, to sacrificial law. The whole point that Messiah came is to fulfill the sacrifices of the law. That's what Hebrews is all about. The book of Hebrews is, is expressing that Yeshua not only is our king, the king of Judah, the, the lion of Judah, but he's our high priest. He fulfilled the sacrifice. Now he's in the line of what is called the line of Melchizedek, not in the line of Aaron. It's a priesthood that exceeds that of the earthly priesthood. So will there be sacrifices reinstalled? Sure. But people are going to want a new temple. And I'm telling you right now, once this temple is reinstalled, right, there's going to be Levite priests. They're going to be, and then you're going to see a lot of these people who are in the Torah movements. They're going to be like, oh, this is of God because... They've rejected Paul's writings. They rejected the Messiah's warnings about like the, the lawless one's going to come. And he, they says, don't go, don't go there. If they tell him the Messiah's here, don't go, don't believe them. And so why am I, um, you know, taking time out to, to try to warn people like he's going to come back the same way he can't, he left on the Mount of Olives, right? I've said this before. He, he ascended to the father in heaven on the Mount of Olives, right? In Acts chapter one, he's going to come back the same way that he said, I'm gonna come back the same way, like in reverse, where Zechariah 14 says he's gonna stand on the Mount of Olives and there's gonna be a ton of destruction at that time in the land of Judea. And so Yeshua, the Messiah, warned his people, go run to the hills. You know, the shaking is gonna happen. The birth pains are happening. So we're warned not to follow this lawless one. So he says, um, he's gonna slam, uh, slam with the breath of his mouth. Um, and now verse 9 says, The coming of the lawless one is connected to the activity of Satan, our adversary, with all power and signs and false wonders. How will the adversary fool people with signs and false wonders? Well, internet, videos, right? Streaming services where they, they have holograms and stuff. They're going to make people believe stuff that is going to cause them to shake with fear and make them believe a lie rather than the truth. It says it right here. With every kind of wicked deception towards those who are perishing. They perish because they did not accept the love of the truth so they as to be saved. If you receive the grace of God in your heart, you love the truth. You love his laws. He says you wrote them on your heart, put them in your mind. If you meditate on those things day and night, you're blessed, you're planted, you're fruitful. Okay? That's what Psalm 1 says anyway. It says they perish because they did not accept the love of the truth and so be saved. For this reason, for this reason, because the heart of man is wicked and they won't re repent, he, he causes them, it says, sends them a strong delusion so that they will believe what's false. Okay, so that they may be judged all those who do not believe the truth but delighted in wickedness. So understand the difference between truth and a lie and, and what's, what's righteous and what's wicked, you'll find in the scriptures. Even in uh, Hebrews chapter 5, somebody recently tried to tell me this meant something totally different than what it was, but I'll read it. Hebrews chapter 5, it says, verse 11, about the subject, there is much for us to say, and it's hard to explain since you have become sluggish in learning. It's such a mean thing to say, but it's the truth. If we become sluggish in learning, then, then you know, we need to learn that. For although you ought to have become teachers by this time, again, you need someone to teach you the basics of God's sayings. You have, you have come to need milk, not solid food. Like he's saying, you guys are a bunch of babies. Like that's not, that's not a nice thing to say, but that's, that's what the Apostle Paul is saying. I believe he wrote Hebrews. There's, there's dispute about that. I'm not going to fight about it, but um, solid food is for the mature. Oh, everyone living on milk is inexperienced with the teaching about righteousness. He is an infant, but solid food is for the mature who through the practice have their senses trained to discern both good and evil. So the milk, the milk of God's word is his 10 commandments. If you don't do the basic 10 commandments, then how is God going to teach you more? And so when, when a lot of people are out there prophesying about things, lying to people, saying, I, God told me this in my dream, and you know, you know how many people send those videos out and they get tons of views, right? Tons of views, very little study on it, but they, they talk about prophecy and all these things are gonna happen, and yet, and yet they, they're telling this to people who are babies, who believe it, and they're deceived. Just like a, a child who's raised in you know, a, a lawless faith, they're gonna, be, they're gonna believe what their parents teach them because that's what they were fed. That's what they, that what they were taught, right? But there's hope. 
I wasn't raised in a family that was super religious, and I'm glad that that wasn't the case. But God was able to pluck me out of the fire. Yes, did people, you know, preach the word to me? Sure. Um, did I receive it? No. But they planted seeds. I give credit. Like, hey, if somebody um, was working to share the good news to me and I rejected it, it wasn't on them. But when I got desperate, I cried out to God and he rescued me. It wasn't hard. It was, it was hard because my heart was hard. But when my, my heart was desperate, those who call on his name will be delivered. That's what it says. So there might be people in your life and your family that don't believe. You know, keep sharing the truth. Don't, let, don't get discouraged. Get in his word. Discern what's right and wrong. Don't be led astray by uh, strange teachings, okay? Because strange teachings are going to lead you to deception. Deception. Um, the basics of God's word are very, very um, simple. Trust and obey, right? If you don't know the Ten Commandments, you should know them. You should study. You should read them and talk to God and ask him to teach you what it means. Uh, another place where you're going to see last days um, do I want to go there yet? Um, okay, let's turn. Let me let me turn. Okay, go back to Second Thessalonians two. Let's finish that chapter. Okay. Okay. He says, so uh, they delighted in wickedness and not in the truth. Okay, but, so there's a but, right? We should always give thanks to God for you, brothers and sisters, loved by the Lord, because God chose you as first fruits for salvation. He used the word first fruits there. Most people don't understand what first fruits is, but it's in Leviticus 23. It's about giving thanks to God after the Passover or during the week of Passover, the day after the Sabbath of Passover. They had to wave a uh, first fruits offering to God, giving him thanks. It wasn't a Sabbath, but it was a day of first fruits, which is why when Yeshua rose, he became the first fruits, right? And we're connected to that first fruits through his resurrection, which is why the day of the Lord being the day of the resurrection, the judgment of the righteous and the wicked is a, is a big deal. So if your heart has not received the Holy Spirit, it hasn't been resurrected yet. Now, while you're in your flesh suit, um, there will be a resurrection on the day of, in the day of judgment. And either you will be part of that first fruits harvest and you'll go into the kingdom reserved for his, his people who have suffered, you know, for the sake of the gospel, or you'll be someone who received um, your reward here. You worked in vain, and he'll say, I don't know you. You work of lawlessness, the lawless one, lawlessness. Um, I don't know you. Like, that's a terrible and frightening verse in the Bible, okay? But it says, first fruits of salvation through sanctification by the Holy Spirit, by the Spirit, and belief in the truth. Okay, so the grace of God is his truth. The grace of God teaches you obedience to God's truth, his laws. He called you to the salvation through our proclaiming the good news. It says for you to gain the glory of our Lord Yeshua the Messiah. So then, brothers and sisters, stand firm and hold on to the traditions which you were taught, whether by the word or mouth or by letter. Now, it says traditions, right? What were the traditions? They wouldn't have been um, mysticism and Kabbalah and stuff like that. Don't believe so. You know, because he preached against that stuff. Um, now may the Lord, may our Lord Yeshua the Messiah himself and God our Father, who loved us by grace, who gave us eternal comfort and good hope, comfort and strength in your hearts in every good deed and in word. So grace is the comforter. It's the disturber and the comforter, both. Um... Look at 2 Timothy chapter 3 now, okay? And this, why this is important, I don't know, because this is the word of God, and if it connects for you, then hallelujah. If it doesn't, then you have nothing to worry about, I guess. But it says about the opposition in the last days, you'll see 2 Timothy chapter 3, but understand this, that in the last days, okay, hard times will come. If you're not having a hard time yet, you might, but you gotta be ready, you gotta prepare. For people will be lovers of self, so this is a list people should go through and go, do I love myself? You know, you're supposed to love your neighbor as yourself, but a lover of self is different, okay? It's pride, it's not right. Lovers of money. Man, everybody wants to be rich. Young people don't wanna work, but they wanna make TikTok videos and be rich. They'll do whatever it takes to make money, 
right? Boastful, proud, arrogant, blasphemers. What's a blasphemer? It's against the Ten Commandments, right? Don't take the Lord's name, Yah's name in vain. It says don't take his name in vain, meaning don't say what he said if he didn't say it. Right? That's People blaspheme all the time. They accuse Yeshua of being a blasphemer because he, he, he called himself the Son of God. And they said, that's blasphemy. He wasn't blasphemy because he wasn't lying. He was bearing record to the truth. Disobedient to parents. Wow, that's easy to see. Ungrateful. I can't tell you how ungrateful people are. Ungrateful. I don't want to be ungrateful. I, like, we're supposed to have thankful hearts all the time, even for the little things that God gives us in our lives. Ungrateful. You give something to somebody and they're like, they think it's coming to them. It's the American way. Pride. Unholy. Not set apart. Hard, hard-hearted. Unforgiving. Backbiting. Without self-control. Brutal. Hating what is good. Treacherous. Reckless. Conceited. Lovers of pleasures rather than lovers of God. Look at that. People, it's, it's like... It's all over the place. It's easy to see. Um, now listen to this one. Holding to an outward form of godliness but denying its power. Avoid these people. Okay, so these, you're going to see these attributes in a lot of religious people. Why is it religious people? Because he says, the outward form of godliness but denying its power. What's the power? It's the grace. They oppose the grace of God. Because the grace of God isn't just God loves you, he saved you by his grace. It's a true statement, but they don't continue reading and they don't realize that the grace of God is gonna teach you to live a holy life, set apart. Not a, a backbiter, not someone who tail bears, not someone who lacks self-control, not someone who doesn't love, who's hard-hearted. You know, bless your heart. Oh, bless your heart. Who wants that? Okay, so there's gonna be people who teach these weird doctrines. They'll lead, they'll slip into household, they'll, they'll deceive weak women, weighed down by sins, led away by various desires. Always learning, but never able to come to the knowledge of truth. Always learning, right? But no truth. Um, I'm not gonna go into the next section because it's about Janus and Jambres who proposed Moses. There's a lot of debate about who Janus and Jambres are. There's, other books that show this, some people believe it's in Exodus chapter seven when they lay down the snakes and turn them into. So we know that there's gonna be false messiahs, there's gonna be false teachers, false prophets are gonna rise up and they're gonna lead many people astray. He says, you however closely follow the teachings in the manner of life, purpose, faithfulness, patience, love, and perseverance, as well as persecutions and sufferings of what happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and the Lord rescued me from them all. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Messiah Yeshua, Jesus the Christ, will be persecuted. In the last days, if you want to live a life set apart for Messiah, you're going to be persecuted. And most people don't want to hear that because it's not fun to think about. Who wants to think about it? Okay? He says, but evil men and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. I don't care how your preacher and teacher started. How are they doing right now? Are they rejecting God's word? Are they even studying the Word of God? Who knows? But position matters to pastors, right? They got to be in leadership. They can't, you know, they can't be wrong ever. Um, I'm happy to be wrong. I've been wrong a lot. A lot of people said, Mick, you changed. I'm like, yeah, I hopefully by the grace of God, I'm changing and, and being sanctified and becoming more like the Messiah. That's the goal. He's the goal. You know, we don't lose our love and our compassion, even for our little animals that bother us. Okay, um, it says, you, however, continue in what you have learned and what you have become convinced of for you know that from whom you have learned and from that and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings, the sacred writings, the word of God that are able to make you wise, reading the word of God, meditating on his ways and then walking in them. It says you were able to make you wise leading to salvation through trusting in Messiah Yeshua. Now, verse 16 2 Timothy 3, all scripture is God-breathed. It's inspired by God. It's, it's God-breathed. He breathed, he breathed the word. And when he wrote this, he was talking about the, the, the scriptures, okay? He was talking about the, the, the Tanakh, if you will, the Old Testament scriptures, which, you know, sadly, some of the canon was changed. Did they mean well? I don't know. 
but there's been books that have been found. You know, the book of Second Esdras is quoted uh, by Messiah in, in Matthew 23. The book of Enoch is quoted by Peter and uh, Jude in the Bible that we have today. So was, the, was Paul talking about those books? That's for you to decide. Do you need to know what those books say? Not necessarily, but what I'll tell you is if there's truth in it that helps you discern what's right and wrong because the systems of religion that are polluted the whole world, you know, I'm sorry, they have. If they're rejecting certain texts, you might want to look into why they're rejecting them because those, those texts will show you, they'll show you absolutely that some of the things that we believe just take for granted are not true. Like the priesthoods, okay? And so people are going to believe that in Judea, the, the new Sanhedrin is the true priesthood. It's not. It was usurped back in Yeshua's day. But I think uh, John the baptizer, whose dad was Zach, Zachariah the priest, was calling them a, a brood of vipers, snakes, sons of snakes. Not just you, but your parents too. Because they weren't the true priest. Why do you think everyone's confused about calendars? Because, well, it's not, we can't accept that because we can't do our moon worship. It's the same stuff, guys. So yeah, is it important? It tells you about last day's judgment in there too, which accords with what the prophets wrote. Um, but all scripture is inspired by God. It's useful for what? Teaching, for reproof. Who wants to be, who wants to be reproved? Nobody. For restoration. There's people who are, who are in sin and they need to be restored. For training in righteousness. The Bible is gonna train us to, for righteousness. Not self-righteousness, but God's righteousness. So that the person belonging to God may be fully capable, equipped, fully equipped for every good deed. Every good deed. Why is that important? Well, Ephesians 2 says this. It says, For by grace you've been saved through faith. And this is not of yourselves. It is, it is a gift of God. Hallelujah. It's not based on works so that anyone may boast. But, but doesn't it say fully equipped for every good work, every good deed? Is he double-tongued? Oh, wait, read the next verse in Ephesians 2, chapter, verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Messiah Yeshua for good deeds, for which God has prepared beforehand so that we might walk in them. It doesn't matter what we say we believe. Are we doing the works that God prepared for us once we receive his grace? And then people, what do they do? They reject the grace of God, thinking they're walking in, in God's grace, and they're following in a false light. Matthew 5, blessed are those, it says, blessed are you when people revile you and persecute and say all kinds of evil about and against you falsely on account of me. Rejoice and be glad for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way they persecute the prophets who were before you. Okay, it says, uh, verse 14, you are the light of the world. A city, on a, hill can, a city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a basket. Instead, put it on a lampstand. Put it on a lampstand. So it, the light shines to all the house in the same way let your light shine before men so they may see your good works and glorify your father in heaven if you do good works and it's for your own glory you got your reward god's not glorified in it you took the credit it happens a lot of pastors and stuff they do this stuff they do all these good works they boast about who you know who they led to the lord and baptized and all that stuff they do it you know and then who gets the reward does god get the glory or did you put a notch on your belt hey guess how many people i got this week I caught, I caught some fish this week. You didn't catch anything. You didn't catch anything. Now, 2 Timothy chapter 4, right after he says, all scriptures God breathed is for teaching, reproof, right? Restore, restoration, training in righteousness, be fully equipped. He says this, I solemnly charge you, Timothy, in the presence of God and Messiah Yeshua, who is about to judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready when it's convenient or inconvenient, in season or out of season. Confront, rebuke, encourage. So it's not just confronting and rebuking people, it's encouraging them with complete patience and instruction. Complete patience. Who has it? Not many, but some do. For the time will come when they will not put up with sound instruction, but they will pile up for themselves teachers in keeping with their own desires to have their ears tickled. And they will turn away from hearing the truth and wander off to myths. The, the distinction between what's right and wrong, good and evil, is very, very, very important to know in these times. 
discerning what's right and what's wrong. You might be in congregations or, or uh, worship places of worship, and you have a lot of friends there. But if God says, come out of her, my people, because they're piling up sins, then you need to go. You need to leave. But wait on the Lord. You, 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 wait on him. Wait on God, because he'll tell you. He says, you, however, keep a clear mind in all things, withstanding hardship. Do the work of proclaiming the good news and fulfill your service. So that's not for everybody, but if you're called to be a proclaimer of the good news, then, then do it with joy and thanksgiving and lead people to the truth, the true Messiah. Don't lead people to a false Messiah. You don't even know you're doing it. But the thing about evangelism, and I've done a fair share of it, um, and I know when it's been of God and when it was of me, okay? When it's of God, it's undeniable, it's anointed. Somebody receives a revelation and God gets glory, right? But if it's of you and you, you might feel good about it because someone was like, oh, that was a very encouraging message you gave me. Well, then good. But if you got glory from it, so what? And then there's people who are like, hey, I'm going to um, disciple this person because I like having control over them. Bad. What do you want, cat? Come on. Anyway, I fed the cat. Then she just wants to get on my lap and dig her claws into him. I'm, I'm not down with that. I'm not a cat person. I'm not a pet person. Okay, so... So, what's the last thing to share with you here? I'm not a professional teacher. I'm not a professional preacher. I, I don't think I'm anything special. I'm just saying this because I think there's a lot of people who, who get attracted to uh, teachers online and they think that they're holy guys and they're, you know, don't don't esteem somebody, okay? I'm your brother, okay? My name's Mick. I'm just a guy who loves God and I mess up all the time. He gave me gifts to use. I'm trying to use them to the best of my ability, to the grace and measure of faith that God's given me. I don't have special knowledge. I don't know um, when I see a sign in the sun and I'm not gonna pretend like, oh, that's of, that's of God. I don't know. I don't, but I, what I do know is that God's word is true. And then what he says in here, we should be learning and discerning that whether he says it or not, or if he said it, we should uh, hold, hold close to it, cling to it. Um, but these messages are to help encourage people who are, who are in the word, who are trying to do the will of God in their life and they need encouragement and sometimes there's things that are going on in your life that you don't understand why it's going on, but the spirit of truth, the spirit of Almighty God, the Holy Spirit, will convict you and should cause you to get back into His ways because a lot of times people are depressed or they're angry because they're not walking in what God's called them to walk in. They're not doing what it, what's right. Okay, so Ephesians 5, I was led to read this and then I think we're done. But Ephesians 5 says, Therefore be intim intimidators of God as, as dearly loved children. And walk in love, just as Messiah also loved us and gave himself up for us as an offering and a sacrifice to God for, as a fragrant aroma. Man. He says, but, but, okay, so to Im imitate Yeshua, live a life of love and sacrifice. You know, greater love than to lay yourself down for your brother. Okay, but, but, verse chapter, chapter 5, verse 3 of Ephesians. But the sexually immoral and any impurity or greed. Don't even let these things be mentioned among you, as it is proper for the saints. Obscene, coarse, and stupid talk are also out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. Know for certain that no immoral, morality is so important, guys, indecent or greedy person who is really an idol worshiper at heart has any inheritance in the kingdom of Messiah and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of such things, God's judgment comes on the children of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. For once you were in darkness, but now in union with our Lord, you are light. Walk as children of the light. For the fruit of light is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. Learning, it says, trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is disgraceful even to mention the things that are done by them in secret. 
yet everything exposed by the light is being made visible. For everything made visible is light. That is why it says, wake up, O sleeper. Rise from the dead and the Messiah, Christ, will shine on you. Wake up, O sleeper. These people out there who are saying, oh, we're, we're awake now. Well, be, be awakened, you know, the, awake, the great awakening. You know, the great awakening is an individual cry from your heart where Messiah has made the light of God is in you and exposes the darkness. And you have one or two choices. You can either grind your teeth and reject him, or you can fall on your face and say, please save me, remember me. One of two choices. We can't serve two gods. We can't walk in the light and walk in the darkness. It's double-minded. A lot of us, you know, doing what we can, but still we have our own desires. We've got to start examining ourselves to see, is there any hurtful way in what I'm doing, Lord, that's causing me to have any disconnect from you? Are my prayers not being heard because I'm not listening to your instructions? Proverbs 28, 9. Are we, are we listening for the voice of our shepherd and doing what he says, even if it doesn't sound right? Because we're listening to other shepherds who are telling us things that, you know, from their perspective, we need to trust in God wholeheartedly, not in the, the ways of man. He says now this, Ephesians 5.15, so pay, pay, pay close attention to how you walk, like what you do and what you don't do. Not as unwise people, but as wise. You want wisdom? Get into the Proverbs. Start to see what God calls wise and unwise. Make the most of your time because the days are evil. Discern the days we're in. For this reason, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. And do not get drunk on wine, for that is recklessness. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. How can I get filled with the Spirit? You need that Spirit. Without that Spirit, you have no grace, you have no power. You can't do the will of God. You're doing your own will. Just remember, God tells someone, go, and they don't. Now, will he redeem that? Potentially, he did with Jonah, right? He did with Jonah. But what about the children of Israel? When they said, we'll go into the land, as Moses instructed, they came back, spread bad report. So what happened? They went anyway, and he said, don't go. They went anyway. Well, now we know the Lord's with us. Are you sure? You got to be really careful, so pay close attention. It says, speaking to one another in Psalms. Read the Psalms. Talk to your brothers and sisters about the Psalms. Read the Psalms. For one, I would read Psalm 119. And then start asking God, like, is this still applicable today? Am I supposed to love your law? Yeah, you are. Hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making music in your heart to the Lord. Always give thanks for everything to God the Father in the name of Lord Yeshua the Messiah. Okay, this is... um. These things, I think, when we read from Paul's letters, we have to be careful we don't make up our own definitions. That's why I try to define the words in here because if, if one word changes in, the, in a letter, that could change the whole meaning of it. And that's what I think's happened to the, the faith. You know, I don't think the, the Christian faith was a bad one you know, from the beginning. Maybe, maybe a little bit, but let me say 2,000 years later, we've got... Um, a whole mess on our hands. You know, lots of really strange teachings and doctrines. Um, we've strayed from the truth. And um, it got worse in the 1960s, 1970s, 1980s. Was I alive then? Um, not until the 70s, okay? Uh, so I'm not the youngest guy. I'm not the oldest guy either. Um, but when you do a little research and you see, like, why, the church used to have much greater reverence for God in his commandments. Did they keep the Sabbath day? No, um, not according to scripture, um, but there was a time of ignorance, right? There's a time of ignorance. And you know, my belief is those times are coming to a close, just like the book of Acts says in chapter 17, because we're living in the last days. And it says that although God overlooks periods of ignorance, now he commands everyone everywhere to repent. Acts 17, 30, 
And verse 31 says, For he has set a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he's appointed. So he's appointed a man. It's not me and you. We're not the judge. But it says in Hebrews, it says, uh, verse 27, Hebrews 9, 27, and he, and just as he is appointed for man to die once, and after this judgment, he also, also Messiah was offered once to bear the sins of many. He will appear a second time apart from sin to those eagerly waiting for him for salvation. Make salvation the foundation of your heart's desire. Yes, you were saved by the blood of Jesus Christ on the day you received the revelation and he gave you the new heart, new spirit, you're a new creation. We need to be sanctified in the word, it's truth. The grace empowers us to do that. And we are longing for and looking forward to the day of our salvation when our Messiah Yeshua, AKA Jesus returns and he does away with the presence of sin. And we will no longer be suffering, we'll no longer be crying. And if you die without knowing him, my, it's a devastating thing. Because you'll resurrect if you thought you knew him and you followed in a false way you can't do anything about the past. You can, only do about, you can only do something about right now. Right now in the moment that you're in. Right now. Like, be present. You know? I had a brother tell me something and it may, almost made me cry. Okay? Um, he said, when I talk to you, I, I'm, I, I'm thankful because I, you're, pr you're present in the conversation. I was like, wow. Like, I didn't think about that. But be present in your conversations with people. Don't be thinking about what you're going to do with them later, like go out to eat or whatever, or where we're going to go, live in the situ in the moment. Like even right now, as I'm speaking to a, a two phones, I'm trying to be present in this moment and realize that somebody's listening to these words who's struggling and needs to know the truth because you need to be set free from the bondage that's keeping you from having joy in your relationship with God. Like right now, I'm thinking about somebody is going to give Resurrender their life to God through Christ. They're going to say, God, please have mercy on me. I've been sinning. I don't want to be separated from you. I want to be empowered by your spirit to finish this race because I know you're real. My faith is taking a hit. You know, faith is, faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of reality is not seen, but it is impossible to please God without faith. You have to have faith that he exists and he becomes the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. He loves when we have faith. When Yeshua saw the men who had faith, who said, if you just say the word, I know that my soldier will be healed. And he marveled and said, I have not seen such great faith in all of Israel. It's time to get back on into the, the grace of God and believe him and do what he says. Um, his truth is, is coming to light and people are going to receive it or reject it. That's what's going to happen. So my prayer is that the people who might watch this, who have seen it now or watching it later, if it stays on, I don't know, that if you got this far into the video, that you're feeling the conviction of God's Holy Spirit. As much as we preach about the, the wrath and the truth, God loves you. He loves, he loves me. I believe it very much. He calls us his children for a reason. And he's appointed days where people are going to accept and receive or they're going to reject and run. Stop running. Stop running. There's nowhere to go. And you know that. The things that grip your heart, the, the lust, the things that you just, that make you feel good for the moment, but you know it's, it's fleeting, it's not gonna last. That's why he says, eat my body and drink my blood, right? It's the, the springs of water, it's everlasting. The things of this world will never quench your desires. But when you know him, and you have covenant fellowship and relationship where you speak to your father like he's sitting right next to you or you're sitting at Yeshua's feet. 
That's where the real relationship is. But it won't be one that deviates from his word. So that's all I have to say. I have a blessed day. I pray that you receive the fullness of grace and truth. In the mighty name of Yeshua the Messiah. Amen.